Here's Stephen Law explaining the evil god challenge. Suppose that, after a bump on the head, I become convinced that the universe is the creation of a single all-powerful designer. However, I also believe this being is evil. I'm sure you consider the idea of such an evil creator absurd. Why? Well, one obvious reason for dismissing the idea is that our world is clearly not the sort of world an all-powerful and maximally evil being would create. Take a look at it. Yes, it contains suffering, but it also contains a great deal of good. If you believe in a good God, you face the problem of explaining why there's so much bad stuff in the world. If you believe in an evil God, you face the mirror problem of explaining why there's so much good. So why, we might ask, if the problem of good is fatal to the evil God hypothesis, and surely it is, is the problem of evil not similarly fatal to the good God hypothesis? If one hypothesis is pretty straightforwardly falsified by observation of the world around us, why isn't the other one? This is certainly an interesting way to frame things, to be sure. So how are popular level apologists responding? Well, here's one example, courtesy of Inspiring Philosophy. The basic ontology itself of a maximally evil god can be shown to be logically incoherent. The answer simply is that it is impossible to be maximally evil. So in reality, there is no such thing as maximal evil. Thus, there is no such thing as maximal evil. So logically speaking, there can be no such thing as maximal evil, and no maximally evil being. Conclusion, therefore an evil god cannot logically exist. The very definition of a maximally great evil being cannot even be sustained. As we have demonstrated, the concept of a maximally great evil being doesn't even seem to be logically coherent. Ah, I see. IP thinks that the concept of an evil god is impossible in principle. He essentially spends 12 whole minutes harping on this one point and trying to show that there's no symmetry between the two hypotheses, as if this somehow gets theists out of the heart of the problem. Only it doesn't. In the same paper that IP is critiquing, Law anticipates this very move, writing, There is, in any case, a more general point to be made about arguments attempting to show that an evil god is an impossibility and that the evil god challenge is thus met. The point is this. Even supposing an evil god is, for some reason X, an impossibility, we can still ask the hypothetical question. Setting aside the fact that so-and-so establishes that an evil god is an impossibility, how reasonable would it otherwise be to suppose that such an evil being exists? If the answer is highly unreasonable, i.e. because of the problem of good, then the evil god challenge can still be run. We can still ask theists to explain why, if they would otherwise reject the evil god hypothesis as highly unreasonable, do they not take the same view regarding the good god hypothesis? Elsewhere in reference to his debate with William Lane Craig, Law also writes, Even if it could be shown that an evil god is impossible, while a good god is not, that would not deal with the evil god challenge that I set Professor Craig. For it remains the case that, irrespective of whether an evil god is impossible, the amount of good that exists would clearly be more than enough in any case to show that belief in such a god is downright unreasonable. But then why isn't the amount of evil we observe more than enough to show that belief in a good god is downright unreasonable? It's almost like Law has anticipated this very objection. Here's the crux of Law's challenge. Even if there are multiple ways to dismiss the possibility of an evil god, surely one of them is to just look around. The world does not look anything like we would expect it to if such a being existed and that seems to provide a strong initial reason to reject the idea. But if that conclusion is initially justified by appealing to experience or some evidential argument, then surely the conclusion that there is no good God could also be initially justified for similar reasons. Whether you agree with this reasoning or not, what's clear is that IP's video completely misses the primary point of Law's challenge. 